Good evening, uh, everybody, uh, Your Honours, uh, Professor Caroline Evans and other members of the faculty of the Melbourne Law School, uh, fellow members of the Victorian Bar, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Paul Anastasio, I'm the President of the Victorian Bar. Before uh, going further, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all this evening to this public lecture um, by the inaugural James Merrill Visiting Fellow in Law, Professor Sarah Worthington. As many of you will know, Jim Merrill's died just a month ago. His memorial service was last Friday at St Paul's Cathedral. Justice, Justice Joseph Santa Maria delivered the eulogy at that service and we're delighted that his honour is here tonight to say a few words about Jim. However, uh, let me now simply hand over to Pro Professor Caroline Evans, the Dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of Melbourne, our co-host who has carriage of this evening's proceedings. Uh, Your Honours, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, can I join with Paul in welcoming you all here tonight uh, and to say that Melbourne Law School is delighted to be co-hosting this event with the Victorian Bar and to thank Paul uh, and all at the Victorian Bar for their wonderful assistance. It, it's marvellous to be able to be holding this inaugural Merrill's Fellowship Lecture here. Uh, tonight's lecture will be being recorded. You can see we have a camera here. It will be available from our website soon. Uh, and in that context, can I ask you to take a moment to turn your mobile phones either off or put them onto silent. Now, as Paul mentioned, tonight's lecture is the first James Merrill's inaugural lecture in law, uh, featuring our first James Merrill's fellow, Professor Sarah Worthington, of whom more in a moment. This fellowship was established by friends and colleagues of Mr James Merrill's AMQC and acknowledges the contribution that he made to the legal profession in Australia and indeed beyond. It brings a visiting fellow to Melbourne Law School each year, a highly regarded international professor, lawyer or judge. I'd like to acknowledge that this initiative was made possible by generous donations from the legal community. Many of the people uh, who were involved in that are here tonight. I would like to thank and acknowledge them uh, and without wishing to embarrass him, I, I would particularly like to acknowledge the leadership of Mr. Phil, uh, Mr. Philip Crutchfield, uh, who really drove this initiative. Now, as, as Paul said, uh, tonight, which we hoped would, would be purely celebratory of a great contribution made by the law and, and a wonderful speaker, is tinged with sadness because of Jim's recent passing. Uh, in light of this and the fact that this is the inaugural lecture for the fellowship, I'd like to call on the Honourable Justice Joseph Santa Maria, who's kindly mm. agreed to say a few words about Jim and his contributions. Judge. Um, thank you very much indeed, Dean. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, James Merrills was born in Canberra in 1936. His secondary education was at the King's School in Parramatta and Melbourne Church of England Grammar School, where he excelled academically and won several exhibitions in his final year. In 1954, he entered the Faculty of Law at the University of Melbourne, where he became a member of the editorial boards of Ray's Judicati and the Melbourne University Law Review and was involved in the historic transformation of the one into the other in 1957. He won numerous awards during his studies and graduated with honours in 1958. He was a committed teacher who inspired generations of law students, including many of those who have gone on to become judges of superior courts and other leaders in their fields. He was resident law tutor in Trinity College for 12 years, which included 18 months as Dean of the College. He tutored in the Faculty of Law and became an external member of its faculty in the early 1970s. Jim was admitted to the legal profession on the 1st of April 1960, and by the end of that month had signed the role of counsel. Between 1960 and 1961, he was the associate of Sir Owen Dixon, the Chief Justice of Australia, and he was appointed Queen's Counsel in 1974. 
Through his work spanning almost five decades as editor of the Commonwealth Law Reports, James Merrill made an outstanding contribution to the administration of justice in Australia. He involved himself closely in the entire process of editing and reporting. What distinguished his contribution was his extensive legal knowledge, his personal integrity, and the unstinting dedication he showed towards his responsibilities as editor. He was the longest serving editor of any reports of a national court in the common law world. The high standard of the reports has been widely acknowledged and earned public praise from Chief Justices of the High Court, among others. He led by example. His meticulous correction and editing of law reporters' drafts reports, together with his own reports being models of concision and clarity, provided invaluable guidance as well as specialist education to reporters for over half a century. He was also a leading silk with an extensive practice in both constitutional law and equity. He provided advice to and appeared for Commonwealth and States, revenue authorities, directors of public companies and trustees of major superannuation funds and estates. His paper about joint ventures is considered seminal and has informed the establishment of many mining and exploration joint ventures since the 1980s. He was very generous with his time and expertise, sharing his insights on a number of committees. From 1978 to 26, he served on the Council of Law Reporting in Victoria. He chaired the Constitutional Law Committee of the Law Council of Australia. He served on the Ethics Committee of this bar and on the Council of the Australian Institute of Judicial Administration. In 1999, James Merrills was appointed a member of the Order of Australia in recognition of his service to the judiciary and to the legal profession as editor of the Commonwealth Law Reports. Jim Merrills was not a shy man. He was someone conscious of his gifts, but all these he deployed for the benefit of others. He was a modest man and was embarrassed by the establishment of this fellowship. With that in mind, I also would like to end by acknowledging Philip Crutchfield, who had the imagination to think of it, the power to persuade Jim to let it happen, as well as, how can I put this delicately, the nerve to bring it all off. <laughs> Thank you so much, Justice Santa Maria, and, and I would also acknowledge uh, his honours role in helping to put together the materials which uh, led to the presentation to Jim of an honorary LLD from the University of Melbourne, a very rarely given honour. Uh, and for somebody who was very modest, it took quite some work to, to put together uh, a full history that did justice to the contribution that uh, Jim had made. I would simply add to his honour's words uh, that Jim was involved with and delighted by the selection of Professor Sarah Worthington as the first fellow, uh, but certainly only came to that conclusion after a careful and deep reading of much of her work. I know he would have very much liked to have been here tonight to hear her speak. Let me turn then to the introduction of tonight's speaker, Professor Sarah Worthington, who is the Downing Professor of the Laws of England at the University of Cambridge, a Fellow of Trinity College and a bencher of the Middle Temple. Her main research interests are in commercial equity and corporate law, and she's co-director of the Cambridge Private Law Centre. She's worked on law reform bodies in the United Kingdom, Europe and here in Australia, including as a consultant to the UK Law Commission and a member of the working groups of the Bank of England Financial Markets Law Committee and the UK Company Law Review. She is currently a member of the American Law Institute's Restatements Property International Advisory Panel. She has written a series of books and articles, including her book on equity in the Claritin Law Series, the monograph Proprietary Interests in Commercial Transactions, uh, and, and many others. She is one of our own, uh, and we're always delighted to see her back. We are particularly grateful that she is giving this lecture while in the middle of teaching an intensive master's course, as she has for us a number of times. We're proud and grateful to her for kindly agreeing to deliver the James Merrill's Visiting Fellowship in Law and to share her wealth of knowledge and insights on penalties. We hope you enjoy her lecture this evening. Please welcome Professor Sarah Worthington. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, thank you, Peter. Uh, 
Your Honours, ladies and gentlemen, it really is a pleasure to be here. Melbourne welcomes are always so warm, aren't they? And it uh, always makes me feel quite special. Tonight is even more special. It is an honour to be here tonight uh, as the holder of the first Merrill's uh, Fellowship and delivering this lecture to you. I am really quite sorry that James Merrill's is not here with us so that I can thank him personally. I have never met him. And that's especially given what you've heard, and I won't repeat, about the accolades that uh, are delivered about him. But given those accolades, you'll understand why standing here is not only an honour, uh, but also a rather daunting one. When I told my husband uh, that I had been appointed to this fellowship, his immediate response was this was the barrister who had written the defining article on joint ventures that uh, his honour uh, Justice Santa Maria mentioned. That rather fine article, in some small measure, uh, demonstrates James Merrill's versatility and his impact as a lawyer. I know it's a very small piece of work. But more importantly for my purposes, he mentions the problem of penalties for joint venture parties setting up their contractual arrangements. This was written in 1980 and he regarded the issues as uncertain then. I wonder if he would regard them as even more uncertain today, and I certainly hope he would have approved of my choice of topic. So why did I choose penalties? Uh, it's true it seemed to fit the bill as something that James Merrill himself, Merrill himself might have had a continuing interest in, and it's also true that both the Australian and the UK courts have been remarkably active in the last four years, and so that adds a bit of spice to any lecture. But even more than that, for anyone who's interested in private law in general and commercial endeavours in particular, the area of penalties is inherently fascinating. And this is because it throws into sharp relief the common assertion that party autonomy and freedom of contract are important values in common law systems, especially in their commercial regimes. So as Lord Diplock put it in Photo Production and Securicore Transport, a basic principle of the common law of contract, I'm missing out some words, is that the parties to a contract are free to determine for themselves what primary obligations they will accept. They may state these in express words in the contract itself, and where they do, the statement is determinative. And then he turned to the common law's default rules, and he continued, if the parties wish to reject or modify those default obligations, which would otherwise be so incorporated, they are fully at liberty to do so by express words. Now, I, I know that the detail in that assertion and the necessary nuanced constraints on its operation do require some careful unravelling, and I have done that in various places. Uh, but I want to skip over that for tonight, because the, the bare assertion highlights the fascination of the penalties jurisdiction. It's precisely in a contracting situation where party autonomy does seem to be prioritised, in commercial contracts in particular, that the courts still move to intervene and to interfere with the substantive arrangements agreed between the parties. Now I know that the courts also exercise slightly less aggressive judicial oversight at exclusion clauses and express termination clauses, but even that seeping out uh, says something interesting. Note the divide that it marks. It appears that parties are, f are fully free to agree their primary obligations, the price, the time of delivery, that sort of thing, but not their remedial obligations. They're fully free to occupy the space where the law has no default rules, but not where they propose to override the common law's default rules. Those default rules would have come into play if the parties had been silent, but where the parties make their own arrangement, then it seems the courts are concerned if there's too much deviation from the court's own default rules. If the penalty's jurisdiction as blatant interference with freedom of contract, I quote, uh, is to be defended, then its rationale needs to be exposed. So this lecture was intended to explore some of the issues and I've adopted rather a journalistic style in making my points under five headings. What have the courts done? How have they done it? Why have they done it? What contracts are amenable to review under the restructured penalties jurisdiction? And which of these contracts will be held to infringe the penalties rule? So now you'll be able to see when I'm getting close to the end. Um, so by my closing comments, 
that's, that's my track. So I start with what have the courts done? So my combined sense of fascination and ill-ease with the penalties jurisdiction now has to accommodate four cases from the top courts in Australia and the UK, two each. These cases have profoundly changed the penalties landscape. The Australians began the march. So in 2012, in Andrews and the ANZ Banking Group, and then in a follow-up appeal this year in Pachioco and the ANZ Banking Group, uh, the Australian High Court considered the validity of various banking charges, specifically late payment fees in Pachioco, imposed by the ANZ on its customers. And when I refer to Pachioco, I mean the uh, High Court decision, not the earlier full Federal Court decision. And then in England, in 2015, the Supreme Court heard conjoined appeals in Cavendish and El Desi and Parking Eye and Beavis. The first case, the Macdessie case, concerned a claim worth $40 million relating to a contract, the terms of which on one view defined the sale price for shares which delivered a controlling interest in an advertising group, and on another view imposed a penalty for breach by the seller of what was otherwise legitimate contractual restraint of trade clause. In the second case, it's almost from the sublime to the ridiculous, moving from a $40 million claim uh, to a parking ticket, in Parking Eye and Beavis that concerned an £85 parking ticket issued for overstaying the permitted period of free parking in a shopping centre car park. So I suppose in themselves these cases illustrate the broad range of factual circumstances which are amenable to oversight under the penalties jurisdiction. But earlier cases were just as broad. They illustrate that penalty claims are being advanced in the context of fees charged for late completion of contracts, breach of restraint of trade clauses, breach of film screening licenses, interest rate hikes for breach of loan contracts, liquidated damages for wrongful dismissal, dismissal and on and on. So <coughs> this covers an awful lot of commercial activity. And yet I suppose one rider might be added to all of this. Despite my own dissatisfaction, despair even, at the state of the law, in none of these leading cases uh, was the claim for, of a penalty upheld. And that includes not only the four recent decisions under particular discussion here tonight, but also the vast majority of the leading decisions over the decades in both jurisdictions. So I suppose that suggests in practical terms that contracting parties have little to fear from the jurisdiction, and its potential for interference with freedom of contract. But the waters which have to be negotiated are pretty choppy, and perhaps choppier still uh, after the last four years of judicial hyperactivity. So, second heading, how have the courts interfered to make these waters choppier? Neither jurisdiction overruled any earlier cases and yet both jurisdictions have adopted, in my view, a completely different view of the previous leading case on penalties. And that has obviously had profound consequences. I suppose if you're thinking about uh, what we do with legal precedents, it's a stark reminder that a turn in the road, almost a you know, sharp left turn in the road in applicable le legal principles is not necessarily signposted by overruling early authorities. So the earlier leading case, as you all know, uh, was the House of Lords decision in Dunlop Pneumatic Tyre Company and New Garage and Motor Company. It was a case uh, where the House of Lords held that a retail price maintenance clause with a fee of five pounds per breach was a liquidated damages clause, not a penalty clause. And because of that, it was a valid term in the contract and not void as a penalty. In reaching that conclusion, one of the law lords, Lord Dunedin, set out his guidance on the test for a penalty by way of four numbered points, and then the last point had four further sub-points. So with all the attraction, do you remember when you were students? With all the attraction so often ascribed to numbered lists, this test quickly achieved the status of a quasi-statutory code in the subsequent case law. Now the detail is not really relevant here, and I don't want to read out you know, all the long list, but in essence, Lord Dunedin suggested that uh, the essence of a penalty is the payment of money stipulated as interorum of the offending party, uh, while by contrast, the essence of a liquidate, liquidated damages clause is 
a genuine coven covenanted pre-estimate of damage, and that uh, provisions will be held to be a penalty if the sum stipulated for is extravagant and unconscionable in amount in comparison with the greatest loss that could conceivably be proved to have followed from the breach. So notice that the test involves a simple opposition between a penalty and a liquidated damages clause. The clause under review will come under one or other of those categories. Moreover, moreover the classification under either head depends on the degree to which the party's nominated damages sum differs from what might be recovered by way of damages under the common law default rules. Inherently, therefore, the relevant clause will be one which operates on breach, and to avoid being caught by the rule, parties will not be able to provide privately for substantially more by way of liquidated damages than they would have obtained under the default rule on damages. Back to my earlier point on default rules. Inevitably, of course, uh, the rule was subject to later adjustments and growing subtleties which blunt the sharpness of that bald assertion that I've just stated. I want to ignore those subtleties for now and just turn immediately to the activity in the last four years. So the four recent cases have substantially reinterpreted Dunlop. Without exception, they did it, as I've already said, not by overruling that case, but by shifting their focus from Lord Dunedin's formulaic approach, at least as it was expressed in later cases, to Lord Atkinson's more pragmatic and commercially oriented one. And in particular, Lord Atkinson had expressly recognised Dunlop, the company's wider interest in retail price maintenance, when it was legal, uh, across all its retailers, not just uh, controlling the defendant who was in front of the court. Um, the claimant who was in front of the court. So the significant shift in this focus from Lord Dunedin to Lord Atkinson was the modern judicial recognition of the existence of a broad range of non-financial interests that the parties to a contract might legitimately protect. So you can see that that's going to be the beginning of the unravelling of this test that I've just set out for you. The shift in focus from Lord Dunedin to Lord Atkinson was common to both the Australian High Court and the UK Supreme Court, but did the courts shift towards the same ends? The courts themselves suggested that they have not, with each recognising divergences between their different approaches. Indeed, they do so rather robustly, if I might say so. The UK Supreme Court suggested that Andrews involved a radical departure from the previous understanding of the law, and they didn't mean that as a compliment, uh, and they refused to follow in those footsteps. Responding in a kind of tit-for-tat way, the Australian High Court in Pacioco suggested that to the extent that the statement refers to the common law of Australia, it's wrong and appears to be based on a misunderstanding of Andrews. Gotcha. I doubt the divide though, is as substantial as the courts themselves suggest, uh, but we'll be in a better position to judge that by the end of my pages. The Andrews decision departed from previous orthodox understanding of the penalty doctrine in two further significant respects. First, it discarded the breach requirement. This reduces the party's ability to draft around the penalties rule but the change introduces its own complications, which I want to return to. And secondly, the High Court indicated that the penalty doctrine had its original foundations in equity, and those foundations remained active. They had not withered and died in favour of the later developing common law rule. The result, as Pacioco makes plain, is that both jurisdictions are operational in Australia. Parties will generally rely on the common law rules, but the equitable rules will help, especially in circumstances where the doctrine is extended to cover non-breach situations or where performance is needed rather than damages or money. Recovery thereof. So, so these equity cases are rare cases, as acknowledged in, as acknowledged in Pacioco. Indeed, to my knowledge, the consideration of non-breach cases in Andrews seems to be the only modern instance. Pacioco itself was recognised by the court as exclusively common law. The clause operated on breach and the only consideration was whether the money payment provided for by way of the late fees was penal or not. 
Now, there's insufficient time to, and you might be thankful, for me to discuss this particular equity move in detail. But I wonder if I'm perhaps the only person not persuaded by this analysis. I myself think that the early equity cases on penal bonds approach the problem on the basis that the arrangement between the parties is that the penal bond is provided by way of security only, not as an alternative secondary mode of performance of the contract. And so the legal solution, which the courts will permit, follows directly from that particular arrangement between the parties. Enforcement rights against the security is barred beyond the interest which is secured. We're very used to that kind of arrangement. This view of the cases, to me, seems to be reinforced, not undermined, by all the discussion in Pacioco itself this year. In that sense, equity's approach to penal bonds shares much with equity's approach to relief from forfeiture in the class of cases where the forfeiture provision is inserted by way of security for performance of a primary obligation. Although I'm firmly of the view that these issues will return to plague the courts in subsequent cases, uh, I can imagine that these alleyways are perhaps not what you want to hear about tonight. So just to summarise the Australian position, the High Court's made three quite significant advances on the previous orthodoxy in Dunlop. It's expanded the rule beyond the penalties slash liquidated damages direct comparison. Secondly, it's eliminated the breach requirement and thus the ability to draft very easily around the clause. And thirdly, it's reclaimed a surviving equitable penalties jurisdiction, giving the court added flexibility in intervening in the party's arrangements. Interestingly, the first move seems to me to favour the parties who want their clause to work, whereas the last two uh, favour the court in intervening. Now, turning to the UK, there was a seven-member Supreme Court panel, so this on its own suggests that the court was ready to do something radical. But they pursued, a pr and they pursued a rather similar track to the uh, Australian High Court. They too discarded the Lord Dunedin formulation in favour of the broader Lord Atkinson approach, suggesting that this was not only a preferable approach, but was indeed the approach in Dunlop itself, including Lord Dunedin's approach, notwithstanding what had followed in subsequent cases. On the other hand, the UK Supreme Court explicitly retained the breach requirement, refusing to follow the Australian lead, <clears throat> and suggesting that the jurisdiction, the penalties jurisdiction, was anomalous enough already without the court volunteering to expand its potential application. Nevertheless, it conceded that this question of whether a clause was triggered by breach should be judged as a matter of substance, not form. And that, and certain other features, may leave very little between the Australian approach and the UK approach. Thirdly, the Supreme Court denied the survival of any equitable penalties jurisdiction, treating the Australian analysis in Andrews rather scathingly, as I've already said. But the Supreme Court may have tied itself in exactly the same difficult knots by suggesting that relief from forfeiture may provide an alternative secondary review mechanism in these penalties cases. Both courts, in rejecting the liquidated damages slash penalty clause dichotomy, opted instead to focus on punishment. And indeed it might be suggested by the term penalty itself that that's what they should have done. So I could cite numerous paragraphs, but in one way or another, uh, both courts describe the search as one for a clause which has the purpose, or even the sole purpose, of punishing the counterparty rather than supporting the innocent party's legitimate interests. And in the search for punishment, both courts also universally accepted that the indicators from Lord Dunedin's extravagant and unconscionable, or exorbitant, or disproportionate, or out of pro or proportion to any legitimate interest, or all the words that we're familiar with, all remain material. The nature of the reviewable clause and the characterization of it as penal are matters which I come to in later sections. But by way of concluding this introduction, it's perhaps worth noting that while the Australian High Court seemed set on expanding the penalties jurisdiction, you know, this push for intervention to make contracts more fair, uh, 
the UK Supreme Court expressly considered whether the doctrine should be abolished in its entirety. I had certainly argued for this, so I was a bit upset when uh, they rather adamantly declined to abolish the penalties rule, either generally or in the commercial context, with Lords Newberger and Mance adding, we rather doubt that the courts would have invented the rule today if their predecessors had not done so three centuries ago, but this is not the way in which English law develops, and we do not consider that judicial abolition would be a proper course for this court to take. I could write another lecture on that, but uh, I won't detain you. So in short, both jurisdictions have formally upheld the authority of Dunlop, but radically reinvented its basis by moving from Lord Dunedin Eden's technical analysis to Lord Atkinson's more pragmatic and commercial analysis. Both have liberalised the scope of the jurisdiction, although in different ways. Uh, the Australian courts have gone still further and embraced a revived equitable jurisdiction to sit alongside the common law jurisdiction. Courts on both sides of the equator deny that they've done anything radical, and yet the general response of both practising and academic lawyers that I come across certainly suggests to the contrary. On any view, I would think that the changes they've made are hardly insignificant. It's difficult to say what caused this sudden and rather dramatic move in a period of four years on both sides of the globe. Perhaps if you read history backwards, never really a good idea, especially if you're not a historian. Um, it may simply have been a build-up of pressure from this inherent tension between party autonomy and judicial interference, uh, and plus the discomfort over the technical formalism of the breach rule, which seemed implicitly to deny that there was an, any coherent motivating policy or principle, and then all this brought slowly to a head uh, by a series of cases, at least in the UK, uh, over recent decades where courts have really strained uh, to avoid the jurisdiction, pushing the analytical envelope as far as it was possible to enable parties to agree freely terms which impose default charges, interest rate hikes, late payment provisions and more. So something clearly had to be done to settle the jurisdiction on firmer and more principled foundations and I guess that's precisely what we expect of the High Court and the Supreme Court. So, turning to those underpinning principles that we expect to have settled, why did the court make the moves, or the courts make the moves that they made? I can deal with this issue relatively briefly because, uh, although I've written about this elsewhere, my view is that the Australian High Court didn't really engage with the question at all, other than to insist that the real object in their investigation uh, was. Uh, an objection to private punishment. But punishment suggests the visiting of an unexpected detriment, and in these contract cases the detriment is clearly agreed, and properly so, and so hardly unexpected. Indeed, you might think that the innocent party might be seen to be punished because the agreement that it had made is not enforced. The Supreme Court fared no better, I'm not being partisan in this, in Macdessy, the court indicated that the rule's underlying rationale is that a provision operating on breach is unenforceable if its consequences are out of all proportion to any legitimate interests of the parties. But that isn't a reason or a rationale, it just reformulates the rule. And even as a rule, it faces problems. If this rule makes any sense, then surely it would make even more sense to refuse enforcement of any provisions if their consequences were out of all proportion to any legitimate interests of the parties. And we know where that <coughs> would get us. So surely the most basic legitimate interests of contracting parties lie in having the law uphold the terms of their arrangement, provided they are within the law, and I know you can tell me that the penalties rule is part of the law, but provided they were within the more general law and properly agreed. So effectively, therefore, it seems to me the courts are saying that these particular sorts of agreements, even if properly agreed, are not within the law. So we're full circle. The divide between primary and remedial provisions seems important to the courts, but for reasons which they can't explain, and which to me seem inexplicable. This failure to nail the underpinnings of the penalties jurisdiction will undoubtedly come back to haunt us.
it's impossible to deal with hard cases if you don't understand the relevant principles and policies. But despite this lack of clarity about the principles and the policies, the courts have a job to do. They have to decide which contracts are amenable to this jurisdiction and of those contracts, which ones actually offend the rules that have been described. So if I look first at as my next heading, the contracts that are amenable to review under the penalties jurisdiction. Despite the various differences that I've outlined earlier uh, between the Australian approach and the UK approach, the practical approach of the two courts seems to me remarkably similar. In Australia, all the discussion is of contracts which contain primary stipulations and collateral stipulations, with the collateral stipulation not necessarily operative only on breach of the primary stipulation. In the UK, the discussion is of contracts which can contain primary obligations and secondary obligations, with, in our case, the secondary obligation necessarily arising on breach of the primary obligation if review under the penalties jurisdiction is to be attracted. Or perhaps we can use the form over substance argument. Indeed, this notion of alternative primary and collateral or secondary stipulations uh, is inevitable. Otherwise, the penalties jurisdiction has nothing to bite on. It can't bite on a single stipulation defining a mode of performance for one of the parties. Such a stipulation would be at large, and non-performance would necessarily be remedied by the common law's own default rules. By contrast, the penalties jurisdiction provides for an alternative, <coughs> the contracts we're talking about provide for an alternative to those default rules, and this very provision can sometimes entitle the courts to examine the collateral stipulation or the secondary obligation, and in the right circumstances hold it to be void as an arrangement between the parties. But notice the consequences of doing that. The consequence will be that only the primary stipulation stands. And if that primary stipulation is not complied with, then the innocent party will necessarily be left to claim damages under the common law's default rules on damages. Even the phrasing of the analysis like this highlights a potential complication. The court's intervention must be such that it's reasonable to take away one of the limbs of the party's own agreed alternative modes of performance, i.e. the collateral or the secondary stipulation, and just leave the primary stipulation as a self-standing sole mode of performance, in the absence of which the innocent party will be left to damages assessed under the default rules. It was precisely this concern that caused the UK Supreme Court to refuse to follow the Australians down the no-breach route. The Supreme Court saw the jurisdiction to interfere as inappropriate in circumstances where the parties had genuinely laid out alternative modes of performance. However, in that camp, the Supreme Court put take-or-pay clauses, bad lever clauses, break-fee clauses, etc., etc., all the kinds of clauses that you would think might be amenable to the penalties jurisdiction. They implicitly thereby suggested that these clauses could be interpreted as alternative primary obligations, not remedial secondary ones. So then our problem is this. It's crucial to know what counts as collateral or secondary and what's primary. The penalties jurisdiction turns on that difference. It's not called into play unless you've got a contract that's got both sorts of clauses involved. Before Andrews and McDessey, the distinction was purely a matter of form. An obligation worded as conditional on breach was open to scrutiny. The same obligation avoiding that phraseology was not. That was, quite reasonably, seen as yet another flaw in the penalties jurisdiction. But now something much more subtle must be relied upon. The problem was addressed in McDessey, but not in Andrews or in Pacioco. In McDessey, the court recognised that the parties might provide for genuinely alternative modes of performance, and they termed these primary obligations and conditional primary obligations, conditional on not choosing the first one. The problem, of course, is obvious. One party could very easily say, I don't really care whether you perform or pay me one million. 
uh, their alternatives. This is the essential structure of every single penalties clause. So does the change in the arrangement from a primary secondary obligation arrangement to a primary conditional uh, arrangement, I mean, sorry, does that way of saying things change uh, the analysis or the categorization from primary, conditional primary to primary secondary? McDessie held, despite these difficulties, that there was a distinction and that it mattered. And if this jurisdiction is to work, then they must be right. The problem, however, was that the seven Supreme Court judges could not even themselves agree on whether the various provisions in the McDessie share sale were conditional primary obligations, i.e. redefining the sale price and reshaping the primary relationship between the parties, or secondary obligations, defining the remedial consequences following a breach and therefore amenable to the penalties jurisdiction. That clearly won't do. If seven Supreme Court judges can't agree, then this is not the kind of rule that we can require commercial parties to abide by and their lawyers to advise on. Now, I think given the very particular and precise wording used in Andrews in describing primary and collateral obligations, precisely the same issue is likely to arise on the appropriate facts in Australia. And I hate to say it, but this problem seems to me insoluble. To me, it indicates a flaw in the logic which is otherwise presented quite attractively in both Andrews and McDessie. Where one party fails to perform under the first option in a contract, is there any test which can determine whether the second option is, at law, a collateral or secondary obligation, and thus reviewable, or merely a conditional primary obligation or an alternative, uh, and thus not reviewable, and yet the distinction is critical. The approach implicit in the McDessie judgments is that the distinction turns on whether the initial primary obligation is mandatory, so that failure constitutes a breach, you can see why this only fits in, in England, uh, and the second option is then remedial or secondary and open to review. But this distinction is itself flawed. If the contract itself provides for alternative modes of performance, then the primary obligation, the first primary obligation, cannot be mandatory in the sense which seems necessary uh, under the McDessy analysis. And then the distinction just falls away. So how did we get into this mess? Some part is simply terminology, and we use words without thinking carefully enough about their significance, notwithstanding that we're lawyers. On any sensible analysis, surely, uh, the agreed contractual obligations in these penalties contexts are all primary obligations. The parties agree who will do not what, and when they will do it, and what will count as proper performance. All contractual obligations are inherently conditional, that's really what consideration is all about. And uh, if A does X, then B will do Y, can be made more complicated. If A does X, then B will do either Y or Z. Uh, but adding the complications in providing for alternative performance doesn't change the principal point. Despite the added complication, these two are all primary obligations agreed by the parties and the difference between them is simply their different conditionalities. True secondary obligations really are different. They may be imposed by the courts or agreed by the parties. On the first, the relatively modern jargon is to speak of primary obligations under a contract and secondary obligations arising upon breach of those primary obligations. That use of the term secondary obligations is a reference to the judicially imposed default remedies, so a different source of obligations, and has nothing to do with the penalties jurisdiction. Secondary obligations agreed by the parties are actually quite different again. Agreements to buy, provide security fall into this category, so do insurance contracts. These agreements certainly in themselves specify primary obligations between the parties, but their protective objective is secondary in that the required performance under this secondary obligation is necessarily defined and quantified by some other primary obligation. These obligations are secondary, 
in that they are supportive only and they fall away completely if there is no underlying primary obligation. These obligations too have nothing to do with the penalties jurisdiction. Many illustrations could be given. Forfeiture clauses often fall within this category um, and in that sense any overlap in, uh, with the penalties rules seems doubtful. I suggested earlier that it seems to me that penal bonds uh, which provided the basis of the equitable jurisdiction also fall into this category. There are no analogies between these types of secondary obligations and the distinctions the judges are identifying between primary, conditional, alternative, collateral, secondary obligations in the penalties regime. Whatever the judges say about how obvious the distinctions are, there is, I suggest, no legal or practical substantive distinction in play. I would prefer to say that all these choices describe primary obligations. But then, uh, on the test adopted in both Andrews and McDessey, that would leave the penalties jurisdiction with absolutely no content. Now, that would be no bad thing in my view, and if I can get it this way then, that's fine. But it does make it plain that if the penalties jurisdiction is to have teeth, and if the courts are not to tie themselves up in terrible knots, then they may be forced to take the opposite stance and perhaps say that every time a contract provides for alternative modes of performance, then the courts will regard one mode as primary and the other as secondary. The court's job will then be to decide whether the secondary alternative could be declared void under the penalties jurisdiction. And that really makes plain the radical judicial intervention in play under the penalties jurisdiction. So, having decided which contracts contain collateral or secondary obligations, if you can do that, the next section considers the test the courts apply in categorising these collateral or secondary obligations as penal. So this is my last main section. I know I'm going over the time I thought I'd stop, but I didn't start when I thought I'd start. Uh, so uh, this last section suggests that although the legal test for what is penal may be easy to state, this is going to be my thesis, in practice holding a clause to be penal is going to be very difficult. So the issue in play is really quite straightforward. Having established, it's the step before that's difficult, having established a jurisdiction to intervene, the court must then decide whether the identified collateral or secondary obligation uh, in their sight lines is penal. And the test they've set for themselves is simple. Does the secondary obligation impose a detriment which is either out of all proportion to any legitimate interest of the innocent party in the enforcement of the primary obligation, or exorbitant or unconscionable when regard is had to the innocent party's interest in the performance of the contract, or some other similar unconscionable, exceptional, you know, over-the-top wording? Now the new context for this test requires a sea change in judicial approach from that which was adopted in Dunlop. Under the old Dunlop rules, a penalty was any secondary obligation which required the offending party to pay a sum that was extravagant and unconscionable in comparison with the greatest provable loss that could conceivably flow from breach of the primary obligation. So the numbers on either side of the ledger were clear. If there was any complication in more recent cases, it merely marked, I think, the initial moves in some of those cases towards recognising wider interests rather than financial ones that the parties could protect. Now, however, we don't have that simple clarity. The new rules explicitly recognise that parties may have a legitimate interest in performance, not merely in compensation for non-performance, and under the old rules, deterrence was outlawed, and now deterrence is acceptable. And so much so is this the case that in Parking Eye, uh, the, you know, the shopping uh, car park, deterrence can be the sole objective of the engagement. Here it was deterring overstaying motorists. It's hard to overstate the significance of this move for the penalties jurisdiction. Perhaps trying to keep the genie in the bottle, Lord Sumption suggested in his oral handing down of the McDessey judgment that parties don't normally have a legitimate interest in performance or deterrence beyond the recovery of compensation for breach. But it's to the contrary, I think. A surprising number of contracts fall outside the compensation 
category. In every penalties case, actual performance is regarded as more important than the market value of obtaining performance. Consider contracts designed to ensure attendance and participation, timely delivery, business continuity, strict confidentiality, or consider contracts designed to protect the value of underlying assets, as in McDessie and Dunlop, or to ration the distribution of limited assets, as in Parking Eye. Whenever the parties agree to prescribe alternative mold modes of performance, one alternative is frequently designed to deter breach of the other. This is true of all the leading penalty cases going back for decades. But although deterrence is now possible, the, adopt, the adopted deterrent, the courts tell us, must not be wholly disproportionate or exorbitant or unconscionable in view of the interest in performance which is being protected. Judicial assessment of this is undoubtedly made easier by the wide margin of appreciation that's allowed to the parties. Nevertheless, in assessing, in assessing contractual terms against this new standard of acceptability, there is now no easy benchmark provided by compensatory damages. In both Pacioco and Parking Eye, the courts took notice that large numbers of people used the banking facilities and the parking centre and thus impliedly confirmed that the fees were reasonable and other objective comparators in both cases provided support for that conclusion. But that approach is not necessarily related to the penalty test. It looks very much like the courts settling upon a reasonable market price for the services being provided to a customer. Moreover, the courts were further reassured that the claimants had elected to use the bank's services, the car park, uh, and indeed to sail quite close to the wind in exposing themselves to the risk of having the relevant fees and charges imposed. But it's not clear that this amounts to anything more than saying that it was an agreed contract between the parties incorporating the relevant terms. And if that's all that's needed, i.e. lots of customers being prepared to enter into a repeat engagement <coughs> with multiple exposures, exposures to the collateral stipulation, then are we really saying anything more than that proper consent is necessary for the clause to be binding? In consumer contracts, we may slightly worry uh, about that, for reasons that in the end deliver statutory protection, and be correspondingly more reassured by the action of crowds. But that does not take away the suggestion that the underpinning might simply be the search for consent. In the Mcdessey case itself, the uh, sale of shares, the problem's obviously more difficult. There's no broad consumer market, no repeat transactions, no obvious benchmarks. Without these, the courts are inevitably thrown back on the wisdom of the parties themselves, having tested that they too have truly consented to the deal in question. As Lords Newberger and Sumption put it, these are matters for negotiation, not for forensic assessment. Uh, they were matters for the parties, who were, on both sides, sophisticated, successful and experienced commercial people bargaining on equal terms over a long period with expert legal advice and were the best judges of the degree to which each of them should recognise the proper commercial interests of the other. And here, here, I say. Uh, so, McDessie is actually not unusual in this regard. The courts often lack appropriate benchmarks. And if all we're going to do is look to agreement, then we haven't got a penalties jurisdiction. We've just got our normal contractual rules. But in fact, the real difficulties, I think, go well beyond this. Even judged hypothetically, how can the court sensibly decide whether a, a deterrent is wholly disproportionate or exorbitant or unconscionable in view of the interest in performance which is being protected when it is unclear what the overly deterred victim is being protected from? It's surely not just protection from the payment of an exorbitant sum, as the relevant rule would then need to have a much, much broader reach. The courts suggest that the objective of the secondary obligation must not be punitive, and this may have been so under the earlier penalties rule, but it makes little sense now that the courts have conceded that deterrence is acceptable. The essence of deterrence is presenting an option which the counterparty will seek to avoid and one which will therefore seem punitive if applied. Of course, the focus could then turn to whether 
this chosen scale of punishment is excessive, but then the entire edifice seems to collapse under the straightforward logical inconsistency in one party insisting that a term in a contract is extravagant and unconscionable or a punishment when it is no more than the parties have agreed as the terms of their deal at the time of contracting probably priced into the contract. The only ground for complaint ought to be that the agreement is apparent, not real. Finally, insisting on a thorough review of secondary obligations which impose deterrence looks all the more odd when judged against other types of clauses which equally incentivize or deter and yet are never subjected to substantive review. So you look at discounted prices for early payment, insurance concessions for safe operators, legal security arrangements, termination clauses, forfeiture clauses, etc. All these clauses are only ever subjected to procedural review to confirm appropriate consent of their terms and occasionally, I suppose, to legal canons of interpretation if they're uncertain. So this is all a rather long-winded way of saying that since the courts have finally accepted that the parties are commonly driven by interests which cannot be measured in compensatory damages, and since the parties can make their own arrangements concerning all their primary obligations, it's difficult to see why they can't make their own arrangements as to pricing the incentives or the deterrents which promote performance by way of collateral <coughs> for secondary obligation. And that's where I will end, uh, bar a few closing remarks. So a pessimist might say that the law on penalties is now far more uncertain than it was in 2012. And to that extent, I suppose people like me should be careful uh, about what they wish for. So I'll try not to summarise all the points I've made, because I could make you sit through this again. Um, but other than by way of the headline that, although Dunlop remains, the focus is retrained on Lord Atkinson rather than Lord Dunedin, and the courts on both sides of the equator recognise that modern contracts protect far more than immediate financial interests and should legitimately be allowed to do so, but that there still remains an unexplained judicial liberality in relation to the review of primary obligations when compared with the corresponding paternalism in relation to the review of collateral and secondary obligations. That seems to me odd and perhaps indefensible, given that it also seems impossible to uh, distinguish when a clause is doing one or the other, uh, and then when a clause is in fact penal. I would venture to suggest that although neither the Australian High Court nor the UK Supreme Court has formally abolished the penalties rule, <clears throat> in creating this profound ambiguity, they have in substance achieved the same ends. Of course, I should regard this as a plus, but the vestiges of the jurisdiction remain, and they remain without a clear rationale for their existence. This will inevitably create problems for the future, I suggest, but given the direction of travel in both jurisdictions, it will at least be a shared, difficult future. So now, all that's left is for me to say thank you. Um, I want once again to pay tribute to James Merrill's. Uh, I, I just can't express how delighted I am to be here in this role and how honoured I feel to have been the first incumbent. I also want to thank the Melbourne Law School. They are, as always, exemplary in everything they do in dealing with visitors. But people don't come just for exemplary arrangements. They really come for people. And uh, so those at the Melbourne Law School and all of you here, uh, thank you. I can't tell you how grateful I am. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name's Matthew Harding. Uh, I'm the Deputy Dean of the Melbourne Law School. Uh, thank you, Professor Worthington, for a very incisive exploration of the law of penalties. Um, Professor Worthington's very kindly agreed to take some questions. Uh, we'll have about 10 minutes for questions. Could you please identify yourself and try to keep the question brief uh, uh, so that there's time for more than one? Thank you. Um. Yeah, Katie Barnett from Melbourne Law School. Thank you very much. I very much enjoyed that. Um, my question is, to what extent is the real problem in these cases an inequality of bargaining power? So what courts are really concerned about is contracts where there is apparent consent 
but the contracting party, if they want that service, has no other choice, as in banking contracts and the like. They couldn't go to a different bank. I think, I think we are concerned with inequalities in bargaining power, and we're concerned in an absolute sense and also in a more subtle sense, really. So if you look at what we do about that, I don't think the courts can exercise their attention to every single case because there was always inequality of bargaining power. Pick any contract, even between very big parties, you know, need to change, etc. So uh, there will always be an imbalance. So we can't just be looking for imbalance. We must be looking for something more. And I think the something more we're looking for is you didn't really consent. Now, we have quite a lot of general rules about you didn't really consent, and, and very often we find they are sufficiently protective. So, uh, you know, we even have duress kinds of rules and undue influence sorts of rules. And then we have statutes that are protective of the class of people who we think won't really have a choice. But notice even with... So I'm on shaky grounds here because I know the UK law but not the Australian law. So in, in the UK... The Australian consumer protection provisions apply to standard form contracts. So, you know, in a sense, it's reinforcing this idea that we're only dealing with cases where uh, you don't have a choice. Otherwise, you're going to have to well, look out for yourself, not do the deal, etc., or complain afterwards that you were somehow um, subject to something that uh, removed your proper consent. So we have these statutory protections for people like consumers in particular circumstances. And then I think you might also put in the same box lots of um, provisions on monopolies and uh, you know, trade practice competition rules where we're attacking at the other end precisely the same problem. Uh, but I don't think we want a, a common law rule that makes us look at every single case where there's an imbalance because life's too short. I can, I can hear. I'm not sure about the back of the Michael Pearson, but I just want to follow on from that, from that question. Um, that isn't the, isn't the problem with the current law that it doesn't distinguish between commercial contracts on one hand and consumer on the other hand, and doesn't it give effective protection to parties of the former kind of contract who don't need it and who are free to negotiate these things, but deny the protection, adequate protection, to parties in the latter kind of contract who do need it. The latter being the consumer? Con consumer, yeah. Standard so form contracts, contracts of adhesion, contracts in which there's, there's um, no genuine negotiation and a, a significant disparity in bargaining power. So are they not covered by consumer... So I've missed out all the consumer protection legislation. Well, they, so they are, in um, you know, Parking Eye and in Pachioco and Andrews, you have got, depending on which particular provisions you're looking which, at... Which failed in Pachioco. Yeah, and they failed in Parking Eye as well. Yes, and um, but, but if, if you were to write a statute now... Sorry, I don't want to take yep. over the session, but if you were to write a statute now... <coughs> Wouldn't you abolish the rule for commercial contracts but strengthen it for consumer contracts no. and say in consumer contracts you can't recover more than what your unliquidated damages would be? But in commercial contracts you're free to negotiate whatever you want. No, I wouldn't. And the reason I wouldn't I is... <laughs> <laughs> no. So the reason I wouldn't is by having a rule like that you're either going to have very, very complicated damages rules or you're, going to, or you're going to confine people to contracts that only protect their economic interests. And increasingly, we enter into contracts for more than protecting our economic interests. Consumers, too. So, so no. So, we, so uh, I, I know that I'm you know, in a group that thinks one thing, and perhaps the group that thinks the other thing with you is very much larger. So if it were voting, you'd win. <laughs> There's a question right at the back. Well, we have a very well developed statutory regime for unconscionable conduct in Australia, which applies to all contracts, commercial or otherwise. So, what, what purpose does a rule in relation to penalties have 
any longer in Australia? Is None. The first question. No, I, I <laughs> And because the I mean, you're ask, you're actually, if you're looking at unconscionability, you're asking a better question, much well, better question. The only relevant question. And mm. If it's not unconscionable, then it won't be a valid. But in the UK, do you have such a, a statutory regime? No. Unconscionable. No. That's your problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think so. So, in in a sense, what we're left with is more of a patchwork. It's a bit like. You know, the debate that the UK lawyers have with the continental lawyers about good faith. And you end up, if you put together the UK patchwork, actually the end result in most contracts is pretty much the same in European contract law and UK contract law. We get to the point by different routes, uh, but we probably get to much the same point. And I, I, I think, although I certainly haven't done it anyway, I haven't even scratched the surface on the research, but I think very often that might be true about uh, using unconscionability. There are different routes to delivering at least, the, you know, keeping people in the same tram tracks. Uh, no doubt you'll have cases where you give protection and we don't have any regime at all. You know that the English lawyers don't like unconscionability very much. <laughs> it's an Australian thing. <laughs> uh, Nick Bourne, solicitor. Um, slight change of topic. Limited liability clauses have been described as penalty clauses in verse. Uh, do you think that by creative drafting, putting the obligation to pay something first and limiting liability on the basis of some kind of performance leaves room to draft around this new approach or will the substance of the formal approach prevail in any kind of creative drafting to escape the penalties document? Just give me an example. Give me, give me a really simple example. Uh, you must pay me a million dollars unless you deliver to me the following goods on the following day. So, I mean, really under the new penalties rule where we're not, you know, in the Australian jurisdiction, there's no condition on breach anyway. So we're just looking at how these arrangements work and you've got a provision to, for two things you might do, then I know I can't tell the difference between these two things, but it is a contract where you've got a choice between two things. So potentially it's open to review, it would seem to me, under uh, the penalties jurisdiction. Perhaps yes? a more complicated example would be, you must pay me a million dollars, you are not obliged to pay any damages if you don't pay, except for the damage I suffer as a result of you not delivering to me certain goods on a certain day. I am falling within a category of clause, limited liability clauses that we know exist and are enforceable. I'm afraid I don't see what the million is doing and perhaps I should just talk to you offline. Yes. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> you, you know, I, so in some ways these penalties penalty clauses can get very emotive. So I remember giving a paper this was years ago before all these cases uh, emerged where there was a group of academics, you know, and the example given was there's a window cleaner, there's always a window cleaner when academics are talking. And the deal is that, you know, if you don't clean my windows on Tuesday, then you'll pay me a million dollars. And the window cleaner signs up to this contract and doesn't clean the windows on Tuesday morning, so is liable for a million dollars. Is that fair? Uh, well, I would say probably 99.9% .9 of the room thought, no, that definitely wasn't fair. And I think that if you've got that kind of contract, what you've really got is something that seems so ridiculous on its face that your first question that you have to ask is, is this a binding legal arrangement? You know, was it just like this soap powder washes these clothes whiter than white. Do we really believe that? We're going to sue for damages if it doesn't work? So, you know, of course I'll be there on Tuesday, Sarah. You know, a million dollars if I'm not. I don't believe that's a legally binding contract when someone says that to me. So, you know, I, I was quite firm on this, that if, you know, that's ridiculous, nobody's going to agree that, but if they actually do, if they actually do, and I think it would be quite difficult to prove they had, then you've got a contract, and I don't see why it shouldn't be enforced. But I think as soon as you end up with things where our automatic reaction is, 
that's ridiculous, nobody would agree to that, then we're in the area where obviously we have to ask a consent question. And you realise that that's a sliding scale, isn't it? When you go into a shop and buy something at the market price, then you assume that we're doing the deal. We're actually intending to contract, and we did buy it, and we handed over our money intending to hand it over and get the goods. But if it's something more odd, we might ask more questions, and if it's something very, very odd, then we'd require quite dramatic proof that there was proper consent. And I'd much rather deal with these difficult cases like that. And I, So perhaps I'm being naive about this, but I think quite a lot of the unconscionability idea would be dealt with like that. You know, it, you're asking a question about whether people really committed to a deal. And I don't think the court should then intervene, very often it's after the event, you know, oh, I didn't think that would come off, or, you know, I didn't think that this, these risks would materialise, I shouldn't have done what I did, but I did. And that's not the place for the court to intervene. Um, I'm mindful of the time, and so I might ask those with questions to save them for after the court, Good. if possible. I escape. <laughs> it remains for me to ask you to join me in thanking Professor Sarah Worthington for being here.